Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is Chemistry Essentials video 12. It's on conservation of atoms. Imagine we were to take three brand new nails and we were to get their mass very precisely, and then we were to let those nails rust. And we were to take their mass after they'd rusted, which would weigh more? Well, you might think the rusted nails are going to weigh less, but they'll actually weigh more because we're adding the mass of the atoms in the oxygen when we're making this iron oxide. And so this video is about conservation of atoms, which is going to basically be the idea that matter can neither be created nor destroyed. And this is going to be in chemical processes. So we usually use a, or chemical change, and we usually use an equation to show a chemical reaction. This one right here is hydrogen and oxygen gas combining to form water. And so in any equation like this, the little subscripts are going to stand for the number of atoms. And so this would be hydrogen gas, which is going to be a molecule of hydrogen. It's two atoms combined. And then the two in the front is going to be the number of molecules. And so this reaction, for every two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen, we're going to get two molecules of water out of it. What's cool about that is the number of molecules is also the number of moles. Because remember, it's not just one. It's sextillions number of uh, molecules that are combining in a chemical reaction. And so what's cool is now that we know that, we know this conservation of atoms, we can use the masses in chemical reactions to figure out what's called the analyte. That's going to be an unknown in a reaction. And we can do that in two ways. First way is through gravimetric analysis, and that's just going to be using the mass of a product, something that we get out of the reaction. And then a real familiar one in chemistry is the titration. In titration, what we're doing is we're adding a chemical until we reach an equivalence point. A real common one would be a acid-base titration. What we're looking for is a change in color. And so in a chemical reaction like this, which this is a pretty important one, this is the chemical reaction overall for photosynthesis, what we're doing is combining water, carbon dioxide, and we're making glucose and oxygen. And so if we look at that graphically, this is what water looks like. It's going to have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And so this little two here stands for the two hydrogen. And the oxygen, since there's only one, we don't want write one subscript underneath that. Um, if we look at carbon dioxide, for example, this is carbon dioxide. It's one carbon, and then we're going to have two of the oxygen atoms connected to that. What does the 6 stand for? Remember, the 6 stands for the total number of molecules. And so this reaction, one of the reactants, are going to be six molecules of water. And so the 6 stands for the total number of molecules. And so let's kind of throw this whole reaction together. So now we've got six water and six carbon dioxide. We're going to have a reaction, and let's watch what happens. So those are going to break bonds, they're going to reform bonds, and now we're going to have oxygen and glucose. And we're going to have six of these oxygen molecules, and we're going to have one of these glucose molecules. And so let's go back again and watch what happens to the number of atoms. So as they break and reform these bonds, they don't go away. In other words, we're conserving the total number of atoms. And so that's that conservation of mass. The atoms aren't going anywhere. They're just breaking bonds and then reforming again. And since we know that, we can solve for unknowns. And so if you have the mass, you pretty much have everything in chemistry. Because if you have the mass and a periodic table, what you can do is you can look up the atomic weight of those atoms. And that's going to tell us the total number in one mole. And so really, if you know what a mole is, if you don't know that, please watch the video. And if you have a periodic table handy, you can really figure out from mass the number of atoms, the number of molecules, and even uh, the empirical formula, which is that simplest of formulas. And so mass is really what we're looking for in any kind of a reaction. And so the first type is called gravimetric analysis. In gravimetric analysis, what we're doing is we're taking two reactants and we're combining those. And so let's throw in the blue. This is going to be our analyte. This is the unknown. We don't know the mass of the solute that's dissolved in this solution. And then let's say we have another solution. We're going to combine those two together. There's going to be a reaction. And then we end up with a precipitate, which is going to be a solid, and then another solution. And this is a real common kind of a reaction you're going to see in chemistry. So how do we work backwards? Once we know the precipitate mass, once we know the mass of that solid product, what we can do is we can go from its mass to its moles. We can go from its moles to the moles of the analyte. And then from the moles of the analyte, we can go to the mass of the analyte. So we can kind of work backwards. Let's go through a sample problem of gravimetric analysis. Let's say we have this. We've got silver nitrate. This means that it's in solution. We're going to combine that with calcium chloride, which is also in solution. 
And then what we're going to get is a solid. You can see a solid here of silver chloride. And then we're going to have another solution, which is going to be calcium nitrate. So let's say that's our reaction. This is what it looks like right here. This is silver nitrate after this reaction has occurred. And so this is going to be our solid product that we've created. And let's say we want to work backwards and find the analyte. So let's just choose our analyte is going to be this calcium chloride up here. So how do we work backwards to figure out how much of that calcium chloride we had to start? Well, let's start with what we do know. We know that the mass of the silver chloride is going to be 5.71 grams. So we've got the mass right here. Now let's work backwards across this kind of uh, flow chart and figure out the mass of that analyte. Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to go to, to moles of silver chloride. And so we're going to use this conversion here. How am I getting this 143.32? Well, we're using the atomic weight of both the silver and the chlorine, and that's going to add up to 143.32. So I can cross off my uh, units, and I've now converted it to moles of silver chloride. What's next? Well, now we want to go from moles to moles. So we're going to make this jump right here, the precipitate moles to the analyte moles. Where am I getting these values? Well, I'm going to put the mole of silver chloride right here. Why did I put a 2 here and a 1 here? Well, if you look back in your equation, there's 2 moles of that silver chloride, and we're going to make 1 mole of that calcium chloride. So that's going to be where my mole conversion is right there. Now I've got it to moles of calcium chloride. I'm almost on the home stretch, so I can put the moles on the bottom, and then I'm going to put my grams on the top. Where am I getting that? Again, I'm getting that from the atomic weight of both calcium and chlorine. That's going to be on the periodic table. So now I can just cross off my moles calcium chloride, and I've figured out my analyte. I figured out that originally I had 2.21 grams of calcium chloride. Now you try. Let's say I asked you to figure out the amount of silver nitrate to begin with. Could you do that? Well, try to figure that out and put your answer in the comments down below. Let's go to titration then. How does the titration work? Uh, I did this all through chemistry, but I really didn't know what I was doing a lot of the time. And so let's say we've got this reaction up here. This is going to be sodium hydroxide, which is a base. It's going to have a pH that's very high. And then let's say we're combining that with oxalic acid. It's going to make sodium oxalate, and then it's going to make a little bit of water when we're done. So let's say this is our reaction right here. Here are the two reactants, and here are going to be the two products over here. Let's say we start with a one molar sodium hydroxide solution. What does one molar mean? That means we have one mole of sodium hydroxide for every liter of solution. And let's say our analyte is going to be, uh, analyte is going to be this oxalic acid down here. Let's say we want to do a titration, and then we want to work backwards to figure out how much of this that we have. Well, when you're doing a titration, you have to have some kind of an indicator. And so in an acid-base acid -base titration, what we'll use is phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein is simply a chemical that if the pH is low, in other words, when it's acidic, it's going to be totally clear. But as the pH goes up above around 8, it's going to turn to a pink color. And so it really tells us it's an indicator of when we're going to get a big change in pH. And so let's just let the titration go the first time. So I'm going to let that sodium hydroxide run out. And boom, all of a sudden it turns to a pink color. So let's watch that again. So what's going on? Sodium hydroxide running out. And all of a sudden it turns to that pink color. So why is it doing that? Well, in the beginning, as we add that sodium hydroxide, it's reacting with the oxalic acid. And so it's being consumed. And so the pH down here in the bottom is staying lower than 8. It's staying fairly acidic. Um, it's staying at least in the 7 kind of a range down here. And so um, what happens when it turns pink? Eventually what happens is add, as we add that sodium hydroxide, there's too much of it. In other words, we have too much sodium hydroxide. It can't combine with this oxalic acid anymore, and that's because there isn't any more. And so what happened is all of a sudden the pH is going to go really, really high. And why is that? It's just because we're just pouring straight sodium hydroxide in. If we were to look at that on a graph, this is what it looks like. As we add the sodium hydroxide, the pH is going to start to climb gradually. And all of a sudden, bam, you hit an equivalence point. What's going on with that equivalence point here? It's when we've run out, excuse me, it's when we've run out of that oxalic acid. And now we're just pouring straight sodium hydroxide in there. And so what is that point? Well, let's look, 10, 20, 30. It looks like when we're adding about 30 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, that's when we hit that point. And if you're doing this in the chemistry lab, you'd go really slow right here, slower than my animation, so you can find that exact point. But let's say that exact point <clears throat> 
is exactly 30.0 milliliters of solution. So let's say I had to add 30 milliliters of that sodium hydroxide solution to hit that exact equivalence point. How could we work backwards to find that analyte, which is gonna be this oxalic acid up here? Well, we just kind of work backwards. So what we're gonna do is first we have to convert that to liters. And so this is gonna be a conversion to liters because molarity, remember, is going to be the moles of anything divided by the liters of the solution. Next, we'll get that molar. This is gonna be our molar value right here. Remember, I told you it's a one molar sodium hydroxide solution. That's one mole of sodium hydroxide for every one liter of solution. So now I've already got to moles of sodium hydroxide. So I wanna go from here to here. How am I gonna do that? We're gonna use a mole conversion. So I'm gonna put the moles of sodium hydroxide on the bottom and the moles of oxalic acid on the top. I've now got moles of oxalic acid. Now all I have to do, I gotta go down to the next line, is I have to get that to the grams of that oxalic acid. Where are we getting those values? Well, we have to add up the hydrogen, the carbon, and the oxygen. We're gonna use their atomic weights to do that. And so what do we end up with when we're done? This is the number of grams of oxalic acid that we had to begin with. And so that's how you would do a simple titration to work backwards to find the analyte. Uh, how much of that original product or reactant did we have? Now you try, let's say I change it a little bit. Let's say how much of the analyte, let's say uh, this oxalic acid is present if instead of adding 30 mils of one molar sodium hydroxide, let's say we had to add 25 milliliters of a 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide solution. Could you figure that out? If you do, put your answer in the comments down below and see how you're doing. And so hopefully in this, you should have learned the following, to apply the conservation of atoms in various processes. Remember, looking back at that graphically, what an equation looks like, we can figure out what these atoms are and how they're being conserved. Did you figure out how to use gravimetric analysis to determine the concentration of a solution? Remember, in gravimetric analysis, we're using that solid that we produce at the end to work backwards to find that liquid. And then finally, where you're using a titration, excuse me, to determine the concentration. And in that, remember, we're looking at the amount that we have to add of a certain solution. So in this case, it was sodium hydroxide. And then we can work backwards to figure out the analyte. In this case, it was uh, oxalic acid. And I hope that was helpful.